So we've seen that age of exposure to natural measles virus is a major determinant of outcome, not only in terms of the disease severity, but in the terms of the ability to generate protective immunity. And the response to measles vaccine is also dependent upon age of exposure. Now, just a word, one limitation of our understanding of the relationship between age of vaccination and outcome is the way in which immunity is measured. Immunity is almost exclusively measured in terms of the ability of the vaccine virus to generate protective immunity in terms of the antibody or Th2 response, and not in terms of the cellular or Th1 response, which is much more cumbersome and must, much less available to automated laboratory assessment. The importance of age is acknowledged by the World Health Organization, where they say the proportion of children who develop protective antibody levels following measles vaccination depends upon the immunological maturity of the vaccine recipient. And they continue, neonates, newborns, have impaired antibody responses to many antigens, that is, the part of the virus that elicits the immune response. Very young infants, those under six months of age, do not develop high levels of neutralizing or protective antibody after immunization with attenuated measles vaccine. You can see that represented graphically here, provided by the World Health Organization. Um, age along the bottom in months of vaccination and the proportion who produce antibodies or who seroconvert on the vertical axis. And as age increases, there is a clear change in the trajectory of the antibody response. This is called a box and whisker plot. I won't go into details of it, but it gives you a sense of the midpoint value and the range of antibody levels at that particular age. The other thing that changes with age is not just the level of antibody, but the strength or avidity with which it binds to the measles virus. The younger you are, the lower the avidity of the antibody, the lower the strength of the binding. The World Health Organization says antibody avidity to measles virus is generally lower in children va vaccinated at six or nine months compared with children vaccinated at 12 months of age. What actually influences the antibody response? The proportion of children who develop protective antibody levels following measles vaccination depends upon not only the immunological maturity of the vaccine recipient, but also the presence of inhibitory maternal antibodies. So child-related factors, immunological maturity, and maternal factors, passive transplacental immunity. Passively acquired immunity from the mother protects infants for a variable period during the first year of life. It's actually actively secreted from the placenta into the infant bloodstream from around 28 weeks of gestation. Factors that influence the quality of this immunity include maternal antibody levels, the efficiency of placental transfer, that is the health of the placenta, if you like, the rate that the infant breaks down those antibodies, they are protein and therefore in circumstances of malnutrition, they may be broken down more quickly than elsewhere. And most importantly, natural infection, which produces good passive antibody and vaccination, which is, does not. So here we have a situation in which when the child is exposed to the vaccine, it is antibody from the mother that binds to the virus and actually blocks the activation or the priming of the baby's immune system to measles virus. The benefit is that the baby is protected during the first year of life. But what this means is that the baby cannot produce their own antibodies in response to measles vaccine. Infants of six months or younger do not develop adequate protective antibodies after measles, however, even in the absence of maternal antibodies. So there are these two conspiring factors of maturity and the maternal antibody level. Other aspects of the immune response to measles are impaired in neonates. They're details that we don't need to go into now. But maternal antibody and immune system immaturity are perceived as barriers to successful universal vaccination. 
And this is relevant to developing countries where there have been attempts to protect infants, babies under the age of one, using immunization in the face of maternal antibodies. So let's talk about those efforts to overcome the inhibitory effect of maternal antibody in developing countries in order to vaccinate babies earlier. Adverse events associated with the high titer measles vaccine. One strategy to overcome the inhibitory effect of maternal antibody was to give what is called high titer or high potency vaccine called the Edmonston Zagreb strain at 10 to 100 times the standard dose. These were given to children of four to six months of age in Mexico, the Gambia, Senegal, Guinea-Bissau, Togo, and Haiti. What they observed unexpectedly was a delayed excess mortality, specifically in girls, up to one to two years after the vaccination, compared with girls given standard titer vaccines, the routine vaccine, at nine months of age. The mechanism for this excess mortality was never established, but it was thought to be the immunosuppressive effect of the high titer vaccine, specifically in girls given early on. For example, in Senegal in 1987 to 89, children who received the Edmonton Zagreb high titer vaccine had a mortality rate 80% higher than children who received a standard vaccine. There were estimated to be 75 excess deaths for every 1,000 babies vaccinated as a consequence. It's been proposed that one out of every six babies vaccinated with this vaccine died within three years. The problem didn't go away, even though it was suggested it should be stopped and indeed was stopped in developing countries. In 1990, in Los Angeles County in the United States, an unauthorized experiment was conducted by the CDC on 1,500 inner city minority children in Los Angeles County. Children were given the Edmonston Zagreb high titer vaccine. And the problem is that children, the parents did not know that it was not a licensed vaccine, that it hadn't been approved, and that this whole process was entirely experimental. Indeed, they were not told that there had been deaths associated with this vaccine in developing countries. The apparent aim was to see if the vaccine could overcome maternal antibody and produce immunity in this population. After this had been identified, David Satcher, director of the CDC at the time, said, a mistake has been made. Sometimes things fall through the cracks. 1,500 children in Los Angeles without informed consent for a vaccine that was known to be problematic for an entirely experimental procedure just falling through the cracks? I don't think so. Perhaps more cynically, in the journal article authored by the CDC, Johns Hopkins Hospital and Kaiser Permanente officials wrote that combating maternal antibodies will not be a problem in the future, because by then, all mothers will have been vaccinated and won't have maternal antibodies to give to their infants. And so babies will be candidates for measles vaccination after birth. Every cloud has a silver lining. What an extraordinary situation that by destroying this vital element of natural herd immunity, they'll simply make babies more accessible to vaccination policies from the get-go. In the aftermath of this experience, what it brought to light was the lack of any informed consent for parents in respect of the vaccine being unlicensed and experimental, that it had been dangerous in other countries used worldwide, that there was min misrepresentation of the fact that millions of this doses of this vaccine have been given. What had been given is actually the standard titer Edmonston Zagreb vaccine, not the high titer, a very different situation. They say no children were harmed, but how long were they followed? Remember, this delayed excess mortality had occurred into th up to three years after vaccine in developing countries. The LA communities that were vaccinated were told that they were the ones who were hardest hit by measles and therefore they were the candidates for vaccination. That was not true. They were also told that in third world countries, the deaths in children following the vaccine were due to malnourishment and lack of access to healthcare. That too was not true. 
Let's look at another real world example of the effect of age of exposure and adverse outcome, this time with the diphtheria tetanus pertussis vaccine. Let us look at asthma. Asthma is a, a, a common condition in children. It is a T helper cell type 2 hypersensitivity reaction, remembering back to our description of the immune system. It's highly disabling and dangerous and very common. It has been suggested that it is linked in some children to exposure to the DTP vaccine. What is the role of age of exposure? Something that had not been explored. What is firstly the toll of this condition in the United States? Just to give some context, 9 million US children under 18 have been diagnosed with asthma. Asthma rates in children under the age of five have increased dramatically, more than 160% from 1980 to 1994. There are approximately 5,000 deaths from asthma annually, and the direct healthcare costs for this condition are in excess of $10 billion annually. So a major problem. And these researchers simply ask the question, if we delay the first dose or all doses of the DPT vaccine, if we give it an older age, do we reduce the risk of asthma? What they found is that among over 11,500 children who received at least four doses of the DPT vaccine, asthma risk was halved in those who delayed just the first dose by two months. Extraordinary difference in the prevalence of the disease. Furthermore, among those who delayed the first three doses by over two months, the risk was reduced to almost one third of the children vaccinated on schedule. Imagine how many cases of asthma could be eliminated or reduced or removed if you simply delayed the schedule, protected them. I want to now look at another example of diphtheria tetanus pertussis vaccine and age of exposure in developing countries. This interestingly comes from an excellent scientist, Peter Arby, and the importance of this study uh, is that Peter Arby works for the Staten Serum Institute in Copenhagen, and this is a vaccine manufacturer. It looks at the introduction of DPT vaccine and oral polio vaccine among young infants in urban African community and was a natural experiment by virtue of the way in which the vaccine was administered to these children. We had two groups. Group one, by virtue of their birthday, when their birthday fell, received their first dose of DPT vaccine at three months of age. Babies would then come again to the clinic at six months of age, and according to their birthday, a second group received the vaccine at the end of the five-month period, when they were six months of age. So what we had here was a natural experiment which reflected a difference in the age of exposure to the first dose of the DPT vaccine. It was, in effect, if you like, a vaccinated versus unvaccinated study. With this three-month hiatus, providing an opportunity to ask the question, is there a difference in the mortality and morbidity in those receiving the vaccine at three months or not? What they found is that among the group one children who received DTP plus oral polio vaccine at three months, there was a five-fold increase in mortality compared with group two who were the not yet vaccinated group. The negative effect was particularly strong for those who had received the DTP vaccine alone with no oral polio, and that increased by a factor of tenfold. This is a, a dramatically increased risk of mortality. All cause infant mortality after three months of age after the introduction of these vaccines doubled. The conclusions of this study are really quite dramatic. They state at the end, all currently available evidence suggests that DTP vaccine may kill more children from other causes than it saves from diphtheria, tetanus, or pertussis. And here is an extraordinary indictment of a vaccine that is one of the most widely used in the world. The other thing to bear in mind, is it is not just the immune response that is immature in, in babies, it is their ability to detoxify their detoxification capacity of the liver. This also 
is a function of age. The ability of the liver to detoxify is limited in the infant and doesn't approach adult levels until around three years of age. And it's important to note that vaccines, vaccine excipients, like for example polysorbate 80, further inhibit the function of this detoxification system. So not only is it immature in babies, it is further impaired by the contaminants and excipients that are found in vaccines. And so in summary, the response to vaccines, both protective and adverse, is age dependent. Immune responses to measles vaccine depend upon various factors, including immunological maturity in the infant and maternal immunity. Vaccination in particular has negated the maternal immunity, such an important aspect of natural herd immunity, leaving infants now at risk under the age of one. We've seen real world examples of age related risk in terms of adverse reactions from vaccines. And quite clearly, one size does not fit all.